Once around, Westerland 1. Westerland 1 is a massive star cluster in the constellation of Ara, described as a young superstar cluster, 13,800 light years away towards Ara in the southern hemisphere, in towards the uh, regions of the galaxy closer to the centre, about halfway between us and the centre. And it's the most massive cluster in the Milky Way, uh, first located by Bengt Vesterlund in 1961. And I just love this picture on the right hand side here, uh, showing the amazing stars within the cluster. When we look at it and we analyse all those stars, what we find is that there are some real powerhouses. There are six yellow hypergiants, quite unusual, four red supergiants, including Vesterland 1-26, one of the largest stars we've ever seen, 24 wolf rayet stars that have blasted away their outer hydrogen envelope, exposing the deeper helium layers, a luminous blue variable, a star, that's a star in transition, uh, very rare indeed, and many, many of the giants and supergiants in the O and B class of ordinary main sequence stars still burning furiously their hydrogen to helium. And one extremely unusual supergiant, Westerland 1-9, which we will talk about in more detail. All the stars are the same age. The cluster formed in one go around four to five million years ago. And they're all therefore made of the same original cloud of material. Their compositions are identical. So quite a burst of star formation packed together into this super cluster. And being so tightly packed and with nature finding it, it easy to make small stars and hard to make large ones. This must have been very dense indeed. And as such, a lot of smaller stars were created and captured into binary orbits. We detect that the vast majority of the large stars in Westerland 1 are binary or multiple systems, some by direct observation, some by variations in their brightness, eclipsing binaries where one star passes regularly in front of the other, the radial Doppler shift of their spectral lines reveals their orbits from time to time so we can see them that way and there are other ways of determining that a star is probably a binary. You can see x-rays and excesses of infrared light in binary systems where the stellar wind coming away from the two components collides between the two of them and gets highly energized in shock fronts that re re uh, releases additional infrared radiation and x-rays so we can detect them that way as well. 70% of the wolf rayet stars are binaries um, and 40% of the ordinary O and B supergiants as well so the larger they are the more we seem to be finding binaries. This picture here reveals something about the stellar winds in the cluster. Uh, this was taken with ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, so it's actually millimeter wave astronomy, not optical. But what it has shown is the gas that's creating comet-like stars with tails, where the stellar wind from one star is blowing material that's ejected from another off in an asymmetric pattern. So quite amazing to see the star tails interacting with each other. So, interestingly, in Westerland 1, I, we have young stars, less than four to five million years old, and very many large ones. And these large stars should have begun to explode. We should, in the last million years or so, have seen one every 10,000 years detonating as supernovae, so a hundred events. But we can only find one inside the cluster that is clearly the remnant of a supernova, and that is the Westerland 1 magnetar. 
It's got a catalogue designation, CXO J164710.20-4552. So we're going to call it the Magnetar. Discovered by X-ray observations using the Chandra telescope in 2005. So we have a, an ESO optical infrared image of Westerland 1 on the left. And then Chandra zooming in on it with x-rays showing all that hot gas in blue there around the cluster no surprise that there should be so much of that but one of the objects glowing very brightly towards the outskirts of the cluster is this magnetar it's a neutron star spinning every 10.61 seconds emitting bursts of radio waves and bursts of x-rays so an x-ray pulsar absolutely uh, astonishingly violent object but spinning quite slowly many spinning neutron stars pulsars spin hundreds or even a thousand times a second this takes 10 seconds to go around so it is rather unusual and it's likely that this formed from a very very massive star at the end of its life now to have had a short life like this and to have already gone supernova, it probably began with more than 40 solar masses. Stars of that mass would have a lifespan of less than 4 million years, and we would see them in the uh, post-stellar stage, the collapsar stage as a neutron star, or more likely as a black hole, because anything over about 25 solar masses should have collapsed all the way to a black hole not a neutron star so it seems likely that this star went through an evolutionary process where it began at that enormous mass but ejected a lot of its envelope around it and maybe that uh, material is still surrounding the star itself now the swift satellite spotted a gamma ray burst from this region as well 2006 20 millisecond burst of gamma rays and very fortuitously the xmm newton telescope the x-ray telescope had been observing that uh, that area just a few days prior to the 21st of september and this grb and it was able to determine that the magnetar was the source seeing that the x-ray brightness rose by a factor of a hundred during this outburst the gamma ray burst so something very very interesting going on there uh, maybe this uh, magnetar finally had enough mass fall back upon it to tip it over the limit of the maximum mass for a neutron star and collapse down to a black hole with an enormous burst of gamma rays and x-rays uh, we're still following this one up now it is interesting though that that is the only event that we have found there should be at least a hundred other of these supernovae in westerland one or the remains of them and we just can't find them so something strange is going on suggestions are black hole formation directly that supernovae have kicked the uh, remnant stars out of the cluster um, in these all these binaries if one of them explodes the other one could end up with all of the momentum and get hurled away so maybe they're no longer in the center of the cluster but we just don't know now I did mention that we would talk about Westerland 1-9, the most unusual star in the group. And this has a classification, uh, it's a B type star, subclass brackets E, with SG for supergiant on the front. So a very massive star, somewhere in the range 20 to 50 solar masses, 30,000 degrees Kelvin but very very odd features about it bright radio transmissions coming from it excesses of infrared hard x-rays all pouring away from this star now the be class of stars these are 
unusual blue-white massive stars, and the B class refers to main sequence stars that are very massive, but not quite as massive as the O class or indeed the W class Wolf Rayettes. So we're we're talking sort of 20, 30 solar masses, something like that. Um, depending on exactly how bright they are and how massive they are. But the brackets E brackets subclass refers to the presence of unusual features in the spectrum, so-called forbidden line trans uh, uh, forms in the uh, emission spectrum from oxygen, sulfur, iron, nickel and many other elements. Um, and it's unusual to see these in the outer envelope of stars. So WD1-9 is a supergiant version of a BE star, SG, BE, brackets E. Very, very rare indeed, and one of the few examples. Now what we think is going on is that the star itself is trapped inside a huge dust cocoon which has been ejected probably from the star itself in a previous outburst or large outflow of material and the question really is can we confirm this can we see what's going on inside and this is where we need the Chandra x-ray telescope to put on our x-ray specs and have a look inside the uh, central region of WD1-9 and here's Chandra's image of the star with this clumpy material around it suggesting that we are on the right track and that there is a, a cocoon of previous ejecta responsible for uh, the shrouding of the main star itself making it appear dimmer than we thought and also uh, creating some of the emissions that we've detected. Now Chandra was able to see that the spectrum of the star varied and that there was a periodic signal in brightness, each of which were varying with a period of around about just over 14 days and you can see the uh, phase diagram showing that oscillation and uh, the distribution of the uh, x-ray periods that could be derived from the signal there suggesting that this is a binary with a 14 day long orbit so there are two stars going around each other inside the cocoon of material and this leads to a number of possibilities one is that there has been a stellar merger, that two stars have collided with each other as shown in the top image and that a lot of material got transferred from one to the other, perhaps creating the very unusual signature spectrum and a lot of material ejected. Or perhaps that one of the stars is a highly evolved red supergiant and that material is being torn away from it to fall into the gravity of its larger neighbour. Now the X-ray search continued and this showed us that we have iron present in the central region. Now that's unusual because iron is usually formed inside the core of stars that have exploded and doesn't escape into the outer layers until after a supernova blows the star apart but we're definitely detecting the emission lines in the X-ray spectrum of iron. Uh, it indicates that there is a lot going on and perhaps the hot plasma from colliding stellar winds is responsible for a lot of the X-rays that we're seeing, indicating that that material contains iron. Um, now we see this in other Wolf Rayet stars as well that have ejected material, but it all points to a previous supernova having created the envelope in the first place. Now when we look at the cluster in terms of very very high energies, we're talking cosmic ray detectors and gamma ray detectors now, what we see is that the central part of the cluster up at the top there where the little five-pointed star is, 
is a source for tera electron volt radiation very very high energy 10 to the power 12 electron volts per particle coming from this central region so an immensely powerful source right in the center of the cluster uh, with the so-called TeV ring around it but then lower down in the picture and shown in the bright orange colors is another region where we are getting high energy gamma rays and this is 320 light years away from the main TeV source and we think that this is material powered to glow in gamma rays by an immense amount of radiation high energy electrons hurtling away from whatever the TeV source is right in the center and causing the gas to be superheated and glow um, by the electron radiation that is pouring away as cosmic rays from the uh, central region so something in the center there is certainly accelerating all of these cosmic rays to very high energy and this is probably going to mean that there are undetected black holes in the center there maybe one intermediate mass black hole perhaps a thousand solar masses creating an accretion disk and accelerating particles to these incredible energies creating a beam of electrons and other uh, high energy particles that is then illuminating that cloud of material so maybe we are beginning to get onto the case of detecting some of the mysteries of the star cluster super star cluster westerland one and i'll leave you with the image of it here just showing what a spectacular sight it really is thanks very much for listening